Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Helen. And this is a Squiggly Careers podcast, where every week we talk about a different topic to do with work, and we hope give you, and definitely always us, some ideas for action and tools to try out that we hope will just help you to navigate all of the squiggles of 2023 and beyond with a bit more confidence, clarity and control. And one thing, in addition to the podcast, that we think might help you is our new Squiggly Career Calendar. Drum roll, insert... <laughs> Obviously, well practiced, everybody. <laughs> um, so. so slick as ever, as slick as we're starting the year as we mean to go on, super slick, squiggly but not so slick. Um, no, so this calendar, we did our first calendar last year, and basically it's twelve months of ideas for action to support you and your career development, and we got a really positive response to it. So when we were thinking about how could we improve it this year, one of the things that we recognised is that often making time to take action is one of the biggest barriers for people and their development. So we've tried to make the 2023 Squiggly Career Calendar even easier for you to take action with. So as well as the 12 different ideas, one for each month, we've included a button on each month where you can just click it and it will add the action to your diary. Because we know if it's in your diary, it's just much more likely to get done. And there are sort of buttons throughout, but you can choose whether you want to add the whole calendar to your diary in one go. So for the rest of the year, every Monday, there'll be an idea for action that you can take and it's like 10 minutes for you to do. Or if you think, do you know what, August is a month I'd quite like to focus on my holidays and not my career, you can just pick the months that feel most relevant to you. So whatever works, we'll put the links for you in the show notes. It will be on our website and you'll also be able to find it at Amazing If on LinkedIn or on Instagram as well. I did it this morning, Helen. You'd be proud of me. I, I tried the functionality. That sounds like I've not been involved with it so far. I did, I did, I did help. I did help along the way. But Helen definitely created the very cool and useful tech that sits behind it. So Helen, I put some of your whizzy tech to the test this morning. You'll be pleased to know. And in January, our focus is on feedback, and the idea for action is called Frequency Finder. And it was super easy. It's like if I can do it without having to WhatsApp Helen with a few questions, I promise you. Literally, click on the button. It shows you your calendar. I picked my Outlook calendar, which is what we use, and it was there straight away, just like any other diary or calendar invite. So this is a bit of an experiment for us because we are so keen to think about ideas and experiments that can help everybody make development part of your day-to-day rather than something separate or something you never quite get round to. And so our calendar is our sort of first way of experimenting with How can we design things slightly differently? So if you do have a go, if you have a chance to read it, if you're adding it maybe as a team or if you're just doing it for yourself, please get in touch with us and let us know um, how could we make it more useful? What's been great about it? Are there any topics you'd like us to cover that we've missed out this year that we can do for next year? We'd love to know what you all think. So over the next four weeks, we are doing a soft skills series where we have looked at the World Economic Forum's recommendations for the skills that we all need by 2025. And we've decided to dive a bit deeper into them. And Sarah and I have done a review of two books on that topic, similar to something we did in summer last year that we got some good feedback on and just sort of evaluated what we've learned about it, what action might we take forward on it, what what sort of insights have we got that we didn't have before reading. So we're trying to make it as practical as possible for you so that you can develop these soft skills that we will need. But it's also it's definitely useful for us. We've got loads of insights ourselves from really focusing on reading around these areas. So what are our areas? So the four we've chosen are originality, which is what we're going to talk about today, critical thinking, social influence and stress tolerance. So there are a list of 10 and we'll make sure that that link from the World Economic Forum is in the show notes from today if you want to look at all 10. I'm not sure if you're allowed to say this about the World Economic Forum, but I feel like they do cheat a little bit because some of the list of the 10, they just put two or three together. Yeah, creativity (laughs) and and problem solving. And you're like, that's two, come on, that's two. (laughs) So I feel like really it's a longer list than 10 and it is certainly quite an eclectic mix. So some of them are more sort of techie type skills and then some of them are more things like originality so what we've tried to do is pick things that perhaps we've not talked about loads before that are either new to us or things that we also hope are going to be universally useful so we hope that these four all four of them whatever job you're in whatever role whatever stage of your squiggle you're at we felt like these four should feel relevant for all of us And the structure for all these episodes is we're going to talk about a quote that has sort of really stood out for us. Then we're going to talk about three things that we've learnt from reading. 
Then we'll move on to one idea we're definitely going to action. And then our final point we're going to do is who would we recommend reading these books to? So for originality, the book I've read is called Corporate Rebels, Make Work More Fun by Juiced Minar and Pim Demori. I apologise in advance if I've not quite pronounced those correctly. Brilliant book and I'm really excited to talk to you all about it today. Helen, what have you chosen? I unoriginally chose a book about originality called Originals, which is by Adam Grant and just gives me any excuse to read a book about that Adam Grant has written, which I will always want to do. So should we start with our quotes? What was one of the quote that stood out for you from the book? Here's mine. Originality is not a fixed trait. It is a free choice. Oh, really? Adam Grant. I know, he nails the quotes. He's so quotable. (laughs) He's so quotable, isn't he? But I like it because we often talk about skills are things that you you can develop in. So something like confidence, for example, a lot of people make the assumption that it's something you've got or you've not. And, you know, that's why it's one of our squiggly skills is what we say, no, it's something that you can learn. And I think that's exactly what he's trying to get across with this point of originality that some people think, you know, that's just a naturally kind of original person. They're just good at that. And I'm not. And he's saying, no, it's, it's a choice you make. And there's lots of insight into how you can develop it once you made that choice and my quote is action is the most powerful antidote to the corporate disease of analysis paralysis ah, corporate <laughs> disease <laughs> <laughs> i think that's fair that sort of sets the tone in some ways to what corporate rebels is all about and, and i wouldn't want you to think it is a negative book because actually it's it's the exact opposite it's a very optimistic and positive read it's like it's something I I really enjoyed reading over Christmas but that quote just did really stand out for me especially because I think I recognized from having worked in lots of big companies that analysis paralysis you know where structures get in your way where things are done in a way because they've always been done that way you know lots of things that it's sort of no one individual's fault it's sort of structures and systems that don't really serve us anymore and that quote just really kind of summed up for me sort of the if you don't take action nothing will change and I think whether you apply that to corporate environments or whether you apply that to your own career I see that that continues to be true in every part of your life like nothing changes if you don't do something. I'm looking forward to learning more about this book it's not a book I've I've read Okay, so my three things that I learned from originals, I've got a definition, which I think is quite useful, like in terms of originality. Of course you have. (laughs) Of course, I've got a lovely definition to start things off. And then I've got, um, but the other things that I learned were some factors that make you original and then what threatens originality. So they're my three things that I will go through. So the definition, first of all, is Adam Grant's definition. And as we said, I think he just does a definition well. So the definition from Adam Grant is that originality is about introducing and advancing an idea that's relatively unusual within a particular domain and that has the potential to improve it. So it's like these these got three points to it. So it's it's something new that doesn't have to be like brand new. It's just a bit unusual in its domain. So it could be, you could be stealing an idea from a completely different area and bringing it into your like industry. It's just a sort of new to you really. And that there's an opportunity to make it a bit better. And the reason that I like that definition was he talks quite a lot about this doesn't have to be a completely blank sheet of paper. It could be that idea of borrowing an idea or building on something from a different area. That's still being original. And you almost take the pressure off originality when you look at it from that perspective. So that was the first thing that I learned, which I thought was useful. The second was what makes you original. And I don't think there's any big surprises here, but in the book, there are some really good examples. So the things that I picked out, and then I'll talk about them a little bit more, are what makes you original are taking initiative, being curious, taking considered risk and experimentation. So those four areas. And in the book, just a few of the things that stuck out for me. On initiative, Adam Grant gives this example of um, people in call centres who had higher performance in their roles for being original. So in like how they solved customer problems, for example. When they did some research into, well, what makes some people better at going like off script and helping people and solving problems in new ways. One of the things that they found was the people that were the most original in terms of how they helped customers applied for their job on the internet browser, bear with me, using Firefox or Chrome. 
okay? And the people okay. that were less original basically used Internet Explorer or Safari. And they deduced that basically if you had taken the effort to use an internet browser that wasn't the one that was automatically installed on your computer, if you'd basically gone, oh, that would work better for me, I've, I've been bothered to try a better solution, that was an indicator of initiative. And people who had higher levels of initiative were more original in terms of how they solved problems and generated ideas, which I thought was quite interesting when you're when you're looking at hiring and stuff like that curiosity really interesting point that i loved he said that we are driven to question defaults when we experience vuja day which is the opposite of deja vu so deja vu is obviously when you you feel like you've experienced something before but vuja day is when you look at something that you have done before with a fresh perspective. So you say, okay, well, you know, how could we do this differently? What what would a different frame? So I thought that was that was quite interesting. And then just the last point of experimentation. He said that the more experiments you run, the less constrained you become by your ideas from the past. When you experiment, you kind of let go of this idea of it always being right and always doing the same thing. What what do you think? Do you think that's a good definition of originality? Yeah, and I think that there was two things that kind of sprung to mind there. One was creating the conditions for originality. You can already start to see the benefits of like why you want people to be more original in organisations because the whole what got us here as an organisation won't get us there. Like you need people to spot opportunities, solve problems in new ways. That's how we as individuals add value to organisations. So you can see how much value originality must contribute to organisations. And then I suppose I'm I'm connecting the dots then to the book that I read, which was more about culture and then kind of going, actually, Corporate Rebels describes, I think, the sorts of cultures where you would get lots and lots of originals, if you want to kind of call them that, as like a group of people in terms of a, it's more of a, I suppose, a mindset and a mode of approaching work and the way that you do things. So I was like, oh, there's also, there's almost a bit about what you bring as an individual, but also the environment you surround yourself in must help you or hinder you I'm guessing yeah and there's actually as well as the examples that are throughout the book right at the end of the book there are some there's a really good couple of pages on actions and some of it is like as a leader how do you create the conditions for originality Mm. which which may which may link to the bit that you've read the last thing that I've learned that I kind of captured for this was the things that threaten originality so I guess counterculture things that you could have in an organization or a team this one was interesting so there are three things achievement idea selection and middle status conformity so let me go through those i thought achievement was interesting because it's one of our values both of us have got well, this one it's both our it's our <laughs> most significant value for both of us so i was like this sounds like bad news this is ba- bad news <laughs> so um I've, I've copied and pasted this in the book it says when <laughs> when achievement motivation goes sky high it can crowd out originality the more you value achievement the more you come to dread failure and I was like thinking, oh, I don't know if we dread failure. And I think we learn quickly. But I think it's that idea that maybe the more focused you become on achievement, the less open you are to experimentation. So as long as you can balance those two things, I think it's probably OK. But if this need to achieve comes at the cost of doing things differently that you've not done before because you fear you might fail, I think that's where it creates an issue. And as you were describing that, I think I particularly recognised that in the first 10 years of my career where, you know, I don't think I was experimenting much. I think I did have a high fear of failure. And because I'm achievement focused, that probably got in the way of me being as original as I can be. Because I can think of lots of examples now where I think that's me at my best, you know, being curious and experimenting and developing, you know, different ways of approaching things. I think I'm good at asking those kind of questions now, but I wonder if it also takes a certain amount of confidence, you know, in sort of like knowing, being prepared to be original often means like doing something differently, you know, or suggesting something different. And I, I'd be interested in the link between how confident or like how much self-belief you need to then also be, is, you know, is that a condition for originality? Like if you're not, if you're not feeling confident, I think it's a, all those things you've described are a really hard thing to do. Whereas if you're feeling if you've got good levels of self-awareness and you're confident in yourself, which is, I think, how I would describe myself in probably the second 10, 15 years of my career, that was probably one of the biggest differences, then I, w- I would say my levels of originality like, intuitively feel way higher. 
Well, he talks about this idea. So one of the other threats was middle status conformity. So this is basically where conformity chooses people to pick sort of tried and tested over the danger of the original is what he says. And if you think about it in terms of career stage, he said that at the start of people's careers, they're sort of in some ways got nothing to lose because they've not done it before. So they can do, do different things. And later on in people's careers, because they've maybe got kind of tenure or they've got a network got a or they've got experience. Lose. Well, he, he says, actually, no, he says it's the middle bit that's the worst. So they've almost got okay. more confidence. To your point, you've got more confidence okay. in your later yeah. career that you can recover, that even if it goes wrong, it's not the end of the world, that actually, you know, you fail, you learn, all that stuff. He says, you know that when you're a bit more tenured and at the start of your career, you sort of, you, you don't know it and you just do it. He says this middle status conformity is the biggest threat to originality because you're trying to play it safe. There's the pressure of progression. People are trying to maybe fit a mold a little bit more. So it'd be interesting, the corporate rebels, like how does that link with this middle status conformity? How do you help those people to be more rebellious? Because Adam's saying, that that stage in your career when you're in this middle layer is the hardest point to do it. I also wonder in that middle stage whether you see them as in your control or not, but a lot more, maybe like ob- obligations might not be the right word, but you know where you've kind of, maybe you've got kids, you've probably got high rent or mortgages, you've got quite a lot of costs, you've maybe got older, you know, like older parents yeah. who you may be looking after. So there's a lot of, you know, that kind of squeeze middle, that sandwich bit, the sandwich generation as it's sometimes described. Yeah, you know, I heard a lot of people towards the end of last year, you know, when you feel like you've had the same conversation but with very different people, where people talk to me about, you know, wanting to progress but but felt mm. like they couldn't because they needed flexibility or they'd quite like to do something different but they needed the money that they got from their current role. You know, all of those kind of things which are very real challenges and perhaps that's when they happen those kind of challenges it's like it's quite hard to make a maybe to be original to make a different choice when you're like there's lots of sort of factors that perhaps feel like they're working against you that's yeah. interesting I, I do mean, think though I don't think I don't think I was very original in my early career I don't I actually think quite quickly maybe because we were both in big organizations but I think I conformed very quickly and didn't you know almost felt like I was like no way do I want to fail you know almost like, like that pressure of starting out so I I didn't recognize the first bit I maybe I'd be different now maybe people starting in work are different now but I think I was very conformist early on and got less and less so the older I got um the last thing then uh just in there what threatens originality idea selection so I thought this was interesting the biggest barrier to originality is not idea generation it's idea selection and he does go on to talk about how important it is to have a volume of ideas but the idea that it's not just having lots of ideas, it's picking the ones that are right for that team right now. And this ability to be able to sift through ideas to find the right ones is, he said, what is really critical. Otherwise, you just got loads of ideas. And he says that sometimes people fall in love with their ideas and they it might not be a good one, but it's just that. Or, or you fall in love with someone else's idea because they're particularly persuasive but it doesn't mean that, you know, it's a good idea. It's just they've sold it in a very compelling way, which I thought was quite interesting. And what does he say in terms of, like, what helps to improve idea selection? Is it connecting it to company purpose and objectives? I'm going to tease you, Sarah, because that's, that's my action oh, to take okay. forward. So oh, okay. I'm glad I've hooked you. I'm glad I've hooked yes, you with you that have, question. Yes, you have, Because I was thinking... <laughs> I, I, as you were describing, I was like, right, I'm definitely good at generating ideas. But then I was, I was sort of challenging myself, like, am I quite as good at selecting the right ones? I don't well, know. Well, you'll have to wait for well, the, find out. the idea for action. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, help me understand about corporate rebels. What do I need to learn? So I think one of the things that is really good about corporate rebels that's really compelling when you read it is the range of organizations they visited so early on in the book they've basically these two guys sat down and made a really long list of people and organizations that they saw as pioneers as corporate rebels and they are from all over the world some of them are more sort of individuals so it might be an incredible thinker and some of them are really traditional manufacturing organizations that have been around for a hundred years that are making fridges or civil servants and so you know sometimes particularly when you read about Juiced and Pim who both sound lovely and brilliant and drive around in a camper van and clearly like going surfing and so you know when you're like 
Oh, Together. they've just gone and spoken. Yeah, I think so. From from what I can, like, I'd actually, I'd love to talk to them. I'm, I think they would be great podcast guests. Yeah, so they've like they've physically been and talked and visited all of these companies that they've that they then in their camper van. Can you imagine they did they rock up yeah. at the fridge maker? I'm not sure they there. did them all in the camper van. To be fair, but I think <laughs> they definitely did some of them in in what's and they obviously like surfing and things. And so I, you know, when you the slight cynic in me, I was like, oh, have they just been to all these companies where it'll feel very hard if you are. 150 years old or if you're a bank is this going to feel really difficult to do anything with but I would say the exact opposite is true because they use such a wide variety of examples and they are very clear kind of the first point I learned is you know it's always really tempting to look for a well if I do this then all like good stuff will happen they are very clear about you know there is no there's no playbook there's no one size fits all But what all of these organizations do have in common is that success belongs to the fast learner. These organizations are just incredibly good. And, you know, these are individuals within these organizations at challenging the status quo and continually adapting. Their ability to sort of unlearn and and relearn is so it's really motivating to read, especially because you know, some of these organisations have been around for so long or or done things in a certain way. And so it feels like, you know, nothing is off limits. They are really prepared to, rather than saying, we can't do this because, you feel like what they all have in common is, well, imagine if we did it this way. Or like, what would happen if? And they sort of embrace the uncomfortableness and the challenge that comes with making those changes. Because when you read about it, you know, some of these changes that um, some of the organisations, let's say they've gone from hierarchical to self-managing teams, which is one of the examples. You know, those things don't happen overnight, especially not in big companies or like the civil servants that they describe where they completely change the culture. It took three years. And so, you know, the continue, and I know, and we both know, haven't been in big companies, the continual commitment to doing things in a different way it's not like a flash in the pan initiative it's not the latest like shiny object in an organization this is people really believing that there is a a better way to be and not sort of being committed to the the structures and systems that have often been in place for like for a really really long time so I think that was sort of the, the first thing I learned was how easy it is to fall into the trap of working in a certain way because it's what you assume is the right thing to do and I even recognize that in Amazing If where I'm like we are a very small organization compared to some of the people I was reading about and there were some things that I found quite confronting where I was like crikey we already do that and we're you know we've got less than 10 people and I was like why do we do that and we sometimes I think it's just you haven't thought about it it really made me think well it's just we just didn't ask that question we just assumed that's the right structure or that's the right approach. And so it makes you, as you go through, you ask yourself a lot of questions about, are we fit for purpose as an organisation for the future? Oh, oh, have we really thought about, are we kind of creating value in the right way? So that's a sort of more general point. You get all these really interesting case studies, but they're not too long. They're really digestible. They're really interesting stories. Second point to get a bit more specific is we've talked about this idea before of involve, don't solve. And you see that with these organizations. One of the things that they all consistently do well is involve employees. And so this gets rid of things like bottlenecks and it means there's much more transparency, much more accountability. So, you know, lots of the, I think we did an episode on it last year where, you know, managers will often get quite frustrated. There's not enough accountability. And then probably what you default to as a manager or as a leader is then trying to maybe go to more top down leadership or, you you know, you try and sort of take more control. I think that's probably what I would try and do because I'd be like, okay, well, I need to get more involved or control more. Whereas actually what you see in like this civil servant organization is like do the opposite, involve people, get people to come up with the solutions, let people self-organize, be really, really transparent in an almost uncomfortable way. And they did find, um, because, you know, you can describe these things and you're like, oh, this all sounds great. But in the, um, there's some really interesting research that they talk about when you involve people, how much it affects productivity. And in most cases, it goes up by 30% as a minimum and 40% at best. 
And when they then describe, at the start of the book, they talk about 20% of people feel like their career is useful. You know, almost like I've got a career that is useful in some way. And it's a bit like that engagement score that you sometimes hear where people are like, I need 10% or 15% of people feel engaged in the work that they do. But I quite like the useful one. Like, does your career feel useful? And they were saying that when you involve people, people are so much more motivated and it's often harder, but the satisfaction levels from people go up so much more. So it's this idea of kind of you giving away control, particularly senior people. It's almost like levels disappear in place of very specific and transparent roles and responsibilities and therefore everything's so clear you know like the clarity there is so so much clarity and there's a lot of effort and energy put into that which you can imagine feels time consuming and lots of organizations don't do because you're like oh we'll get to it when whereas these organizations seem to understand that if we really involve people if we sort of actively embrace challenges and problems and spend time on them you know it's almost like the payoff's going to be more than worth it there's um two overlapping um examples actually in originals which i think support that point so one of them is the glassware company i don't know what you call them but warby parker like the cool glasses by post people and he talked about that involved in solve they had a very transparent way of sharing ideas i think it was like in a google doc that the leaders when the organization was first starting they just shared all of their ideas they're working on in a google doc that people could just just build on which i thought was quite interesting in terms of that transparency point and then employees could upvote the ideas so and then so they got this constant view of what ideas are they working on and what ideas do people support which I thought was nice and then they also um there's another example of a project Adam Grant did with Google on job crafting which I noted for us actually as something to kind of look back on and they did a study with how engaged I think the metric was people were with their work and they had a control group that just did the job that was defined by their job description and another group that had the opportunity to sort of redefine their role around things that they thought were sort of useful and relevant. And it was the people that did that that were, I think it's like they measured it six months after, in terms, I think it was impact and engagement or metrics to that extent, but were significantly higher because they'd been involved in defining the detail of their job. So really interesting examples of what happens you know, how you can take that involved don't solve, like with ideas and people's jobs and then the benefits and, and the crossover of those two points in the books. Yeah, job crafting also comes up. Ah. And there is a great quote, actually, I was just looking for there by David Marquette. Yes. You know, he writes about like leadership language and comes from, a I think it's Navy, Navy background. So again, an environment where you'd have thought you can't involve people. My assumption would be, well, you can't do that because you've got to have very strict systems. But he really challenged that. And I think he was put onto some almost like underperforming boats, apparently, you know, to like turn those boats around. And he's, he says... I think they're called ships um, in the Navy. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, boat, boat, ships, you know, potato, potato. Uh, and he says, I'm not going to give any more orders because when I give an order, you follow it. And if I give the wrong order, we're all going to die. And he's sort of very clear about well, the people who sort of know best are the people who are closest to like the engine in the engine room or the, I don't know, steering in the steering wheel room. <laughs> <laughs> to use another technical phrase there. Um, the steering I wheel imagine... room, I love it. I know. I, mean, I, know. I don't know of a better room to call it. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it is interesting, you know, you know that sort of, I imagine the challenge back from a lot of CEOs would be like, oh, well, that's all well and good, but it's not going to work here. And I think if you could... And we'll come on to like who should read this book. But certainly that challenge is really overcome with the with the range of examples, which I found really interesting. And then the third thing I learned, which is kind of I was zooming in and getting more specific as I was going through, is this process called the advice process, which I'd not heard of before. So in organizations, decisions tend to be made in one of two ways. So lots of organizations you get top down decision making. In some organisations, people sort of recognise, okay, well, maybe that's not the way to go. And people go for consensus decision making. But the problem with that is that's really time consuming, can slow people down. You know, like you feel like you have to involve everyone. And actually, I've been in both of those types of organisations. And usually it's quite nice to work in a consensus sort of seeking environment because, you know, you're trying to include people. So I think often comes from positive intent, but it does mean that you can be quite slow 
and that you miss opportunities. And what they talk about with pioneers and kind of progressives as they kind of label these organizations is they often use some form of what's called an advice process. So this means that for decisions as an individual, if you've got a small decision to make, you just make it, just get on with it. If you've got a medium or big decision to make, you go and seek advice from sort of two sets of people, people who are going to be affected. So I'm going to make a decision about something you're going to be affected. So I should seek advice from you. And maybe I go and seek advice from Vivian, our team, because she's got relevant experience. So she's maybe not going to be effective, but I, I think, oh, I think Vivi did something a bit like this before in her previous organization. So I'm going to go and kind of learn from her and almost get a bit of challenge and build from her to influence and to affect my decision. But ultimately, that advice that you've been given, they say advice is just advice. It's essentially sort of your gleaning perspectives, which you consider, but ultimately it is still your decision. So I could choose to think, I know you're going to be affected and you've told me this is how it's going to affect you. And that might not be your choice, but I might go, well, I think that's an acceptable risk. I think I think that's okay. So I know you're not going to be happy, but I have I have talked to you and I can also explain it to you, but it doesn't mean I have to, I don't have to follow everybody's advice. And one of the things that they were saying about this is it really increases initiative and accountability because it is very clear who the decision maker is. And it reminded me a bit of when you spoke last year to um, someone else who I hope we got on the podcast this year called Rob Pierre, who runs a company called Jellyfish, where he talked a lot about knowing, you know, who's responsible, who's accountable, who can make which decisions. And so again, it's back to this kind of clarity point about going, how do we, you know, like how do we get stuff done? Now in our kind of organization, when you are a bit smaller, I think this perhaps feels a little bit less relevant, but you could, we could definitely fall into consensus seeking decision-making where you sort of feel like you have to involve everyone because we want to be, you know, nice and friendly. But if you're in a really big organization or even sort of, they said it's something like the tipping point is quite small, over 15 people you know, where you end up adding unnecessary structures and involving too many people. That's when it sort of cuts out, you know, meeting for meeting sake and steering groups and working groups that like no one really needs to be in. And it just gives you a lot more, gives people a lot more sense of ownership over their role and their ability to like make stuff happen. And what's interesting is they said when people first start doing this, most people especially if you've been in a more command and control or top-down environment, find it really hard because you've moved from, well, I just did whatever Helen told me to do to, oh, I have to figure out what I think we should do. And so they were saying, actually, people initially do need quite a lot of coaching because you've got to have, you know, back to confidence, you've got to have the confidence. You might feel quite scared. You might feel, you know, like uh, Amy Edmondson talks about fear. You might feel quite fearful of being like, oh, but if I, I'm now very clearly owning this decision what happens if it doesn't go well like what are the consequences of that decision not going well now that it's very clearly my decision does that mean I'm not going to get a very good review or bonus or those kind of things so they were saying actually it's quite um depending on where you're starting from it can feel like quite a tough transition but I found that just really interesting as a it's something I'd not heard of they sort of describe how it works and then they give a few resources um, if you wanted to find out more. So that that felt like something to dig a bit deeper into because I just thought it was was kind of new news to me. So what it makes me think as a small organisation is that the affected by a decision, I feel like we we would know, but the experienced in, that might prompt me to look outside the organisation because because Mm. we're a relatively new business and we're certainly doing a lot of things even though we've been around for like 10 years now, Sarah, we're still doing a lot of things that we've never done before. So we might not have experience of that thing in our organisation. It's definitely just a, a sort of a pause point, isn't it, when you're making a decision, thinking about who do we know who's got experience of this that we could talk to before we make this decision? I think it's just a nice prompt. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good prompt. And actually, I think we have done that in an ad hoc way. I think the thing that you realise about these progressive pioneers is they definitely experiment everything they do is is quite thoughtful and intentional so (laughs) I think it's fair to say that occasionally between you and I we're a bit sort of um we try this one thing but then we don't write it down and then we do something slightly different we're never sort of short of an idea or an experiment we're always quite open to change and challenge but you know the sort of the the intentional almost like the kind of slowing down to speed up and going right how do we approach this 
it's all very transparent. You you kind of have clearly articulated everything. I think you and I often get so either excited or we like to move with pace. You miss that out. And actually by missing that out, you probably miss out on some of the, what they would argue, some of the benefits, some of the outcomes. You probably don't stick with some stuff for long enough. You probably don't have a good enough idea about what's working, what's not. Like you say, you could forget. Actually, it's the repeatability. Because for lots of these organizations, like I said, they stick with this for years and years and years while still learning really fast, but they sort of know where they are. And I think that's often one of the things that you and I struggle with is we, because we're not very good kind of capturing as we go, you then sort of don't know where you are at any Mm. one point. And then you can actually waste time and effort because you have to repeat, which you never want to, you never want to do. So we're going to move on to the action bit now. And the idea here is that if you want to, you know, increase your originality in the work that you do or the team that you work in, what is one thing that you can take away from from these books? And so the idea that I think you could try out from originals is all about idea selection. And this goes on to that point that I mentioned earlier, that the issue with originality isn't the amount of ideas you have. It's selecting like the right ideas. And I thought this is something that we could experiment with and that listeners could try out too. So Adam Grant's says that very often when people are selecting ideas what you do is you have a whole load of ideas so like what's a new product we could launch and everyone generates loads of ideas and then you go okay what's our you know criteria to review these ideas like it's got to be delivered by December it's got to cost under this much money all that kind of jazz and then you review the ideas and he says but what that makes you do is you're almost like too critical you because you've got an idea criteria review you've got this very critical mindset that goes against sort of the creativity and the originality. And so he says that a better way of doing this, if you want to improve your idea selection for ideas that are likely to be more original, is you do the criteria first. So, okay, well, for this product we're gonna launch, what does it need to do? One, two, three, four, five. Then you get everyone in sort of creative original thinking mode. All right, what are all of our ideas? What are we thinking? And then you do the review because he says you're more likely to build on each other's ideas because your brain has stayed in that idea-y open space. There's much more like challenge, build, that original sort of mindset is much more present. So I thought it was a really simple change to how you could select better ideas you do the criteria for what it needs to be then you get into idea generation mode and then you do the review interesting i'm gonna need to read this i'm gonna need to i'm gonna need to the reason i say interesting and actually you said to me before we even started this podcast you were like you need to read this book and i was like and actually you and i had both bought the book but you decided to read it so i was like well i won't because i think i quite like the surprise of these conversations (laughs) Uh, and i was reading something different I, what I was trying to reconcile with there when you described that is I feel like lots of my ideas come out of the blue, but I hope they don't. They sort of come from connecting dots or not from a kind of criteria. So as you, I was almost falling into fixed mindset as you were describing that. I was like, I don't want somebody to give me a criteria. Mm. No, I don't think he's saying, I think he's saying a criteria, then almost separate it. Like, oh, there's the criteria, but not use that to then define the ideas, but you've got the criteria. Then you get the ideas, you stay in a free headspace right. and then you then then you connect the two at the end of it. But because when you are trying to select the ideas, you're still in a more creative space, you're not being reductive. Yeah. Whereas he's basically saying, if you start with ideas and then go criteria, then, you become gradually more reductive in the outcomes. Yeah, I think the point around the, what mindset are you in when you're making those decisions? That makes makes a lot of sense. Hmm, inter- so interesting. So for me, from Corporate Rebels, like what's the one idea for action if you want to increase your originality? I'd almost be coupling two things together. I would be looking at either my job or my team or my organisation, depends which lens feels most motivating for you, and asking myself, what is a system or a structure or a process that that we should challenge that doesn't feel fit for purpose anymore and I'd always be and nothing is off limits be really ambitious about what that might be and then I would be thinking about well who can I involve to as Helen's described maybe create ideas about what we could do differently and don't start from where you are I think this is kind of blank piece of paper create without any limitations without any constraints what could this be so if you were going to get rid of hierarchy if you were going to have full transparency in your team if you were going to completely change how you made decisions like almost like you sort of need a propelling question I think to start then involve people 
And then just think about how can you experiment even on a small scale? Because I I wonder whether the, I think maybe the only downside of reading Corporate Rebels is these organisations are so ambitious. I found it really motivating to read, but I'm reading it in the position where you know, I'm the co-founder of a company where I probably feel like I've got a lot of power and autonomy. I'm imagining if I had been reading it back in my Barclays or my Sainsbury's days, I might have been like, oh, well, I'm not the CEO of this brilliant Chinese company or, and I, or I'm not at Harvard doing interesting, innovative work on management thinking. But again, I think that almost is doing ourselves a disservice about how original you can be sort of within your own context and within your own world. So I think it's, if you read this book, if you read Corporate Rebels, I think you will feel like, well, originality has a really strong business case for making a positive difference to people, purpose and profit. I think that's really that comes through really clearly. But I wouldn't want people to think, oh, but I can't influence or impact that because I'm not sort of senior enough because change comes from people. Back to where we started, change comes from action. And I think we all have the ability to be more original kind of within our own worlds. And the best thing you can do, I think, is to just choose something that would benefit. What would benefit from your originality? And I can see like what would benefit from my originality in Amazing If?, but I think when I think back to other jobs I've done, I can see there how things would have benefited from me having a bit more confidence to be more original. So I think it's maybe connecting that, that dots is, you know, if you just say, I want to be more original, I think that feels too vague and abstract. It's like, who, what or where would benefit from your originality? And then it gives you um, somewhere to apply. You've got to apply your originality to be able to take action, to be able to practice and to get better at it. So I would encourage everyone listening to be really specific about answering that question. Like who, what or where would benefit from your originality? I think that is the the dream coach yourself question that's come from this conversation. And we will include it in the pod sheet. So for all of our episodes, we do a pod sheet that you can download that covers a lot of the key points, the ideas for action. And it has these coach yourself questions to really prompt your reflection. You can get the link to that in the show notes or it's it's always on our website. So yeah, I I like that. It's it's definitely made me think. So last but not least, who would you recommend it for? Mine's really easy. I feel like I could just go everyone. But to be a bit more specific, I would say originals is my recommended read to anyone who's interested in newness like maybe you're working like innovation or problem solving which I feel is like most people or creativity or like creative team cultures so it doesn't have to be marketing but I would say like innovation problem solving marketing would be the first people that I would go to to recommend this book to I would love every CEO to have read this book I think the world would be a better place if every CEO had read this book and if you're interested in culture in like how things get done in organisations. I think if you're interested in challenging the status quo, in doing things differently, if you find that fascinating and you want lots of examples of people and places that have done that, I think you'll really enjoy Corporate Rebels. I don't always enjoy a non-fiction read. I read a lot of fiction. And this was a book that I was, I kept looking forward to picking back up again. And for people who listen to our summer series, I'm usually quite honest about whether I've uh, enjoyed enjoyed the book or not. As infamously, there was one book I did not enjoy that much and tried to, tried to be polite-ish about it. But this was one where even some of the people who saw me over Christmas, the book was sort of following me around with like a highlight. And they were like, is it, is it, you know, like people start to ask you that question when you're giving them the classic sort of book off. Is it, is it a good book? Is it interesting? I'm like, it is interesting. Please don't talk to me. <laughs> I love your book offs. Um, so we hope you have found today's episode useful. As we said before, it is the first of four episodes in our Squiggly Soft Skills series. The next one is on critical thinking. We won't tell you what books we've chosen, but similar structure to this. We've both read different books and we will uh, share our insights with each other and our ideas for action for you as well. So thank you so much for listening. I'll be back with you again next week. Bye for now. Bye, everyone.